Welcome back to the Leashed Mind podcast, mental health and dog training. I am your host, Mandy Bautel. On today's episode, I have a conversation with Hannah Brannigan. So this episode, it is filled with so many valuable nuggets. We talk about being neurodivergent and being a business owner. We talk about burnout, prevention, bouncing back from it, imposter syndrome, how it's kind of always in the room when we are trying to grow as professionals and grow our businesses, talk about, you know, finding ways to find other ways to relate to clients, get on our clients' level, talking about, you know, just mental health and the ways in which it can get ignored in our business or ways in which that we find ways to delegate within our business so that we can not only preserve our mental bandwidth, but also not taking on everything because we don't need to take everything on as business owners. And yet we have this internal belief that for some reason we need to wear all the hats and do all these things when we've never been taught to wear all the hats or do all the things. But here we are trying to do that. And then, you know, some of us wonder why we get burnt out or why the imposter syndrome is constantly there. So Hannah and I talk all those lovely things and, you know, just approach all of it with her awesome, sarcastic sense of humor. So let's tune into this episode. I know you guys are going to love it. Oh, Hannah Brannigan, thank you so much for joining me on the Leashed Mind podcast. It is an honor to have you on, and I'm so excited to pick your brain on all things mental health. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I'm sure at this point, a lot of people know who you are, but for those that may not listen to your podcast, Drinking from the Toilet, may not follow you actively, can you just give a quick intro of what you do, what you have going on currently, and where you are in your career right now? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a behavior nerd, first and foremost. I'm I'm fascinated by learning and behavior of, I mean, of everybody, of all mm-hmm. organisms. Professionally, I consider myself a dog trainer and a clicker trainer. I have had many... Um, phases to my career as a, as a professional from working in veterinary clinics as a tech slash dog trainer to full-time training and running classes and day school and board and trained and home and then you know spanning out on my own and teaching group classes and in home lessons and private lessons and then into competitive dog sports which was weird transition <laughs> I still don't still don't fully understand and at this point I primarily work with Like I think of it as like kind of the upstream population in the dog behavior world. Okay. Um, Yeah. So I I work with about 50% professional, other professional trainers and about 50% like non-professional training obsessed the like true behavior nerd, like dog parent yeah, kind of people. Yeah, yeah, who, who often have roles, you know, as volunteers, either at training clubs or assisting, or they, you know, mentor other people, or they, um, some of them teach, do teach some classes, uh, you know, in training clubs, but aren't really, like, they have other, they have real jobs. <laughs> um, and, and um, or, you know, are active in rescue, like, there's, there's, but I, I am, very rarely working with like fresh dog owners, which was my original population. So I've kind of, ooh. so I, now I work with the people who work with those people. Ooh, really. I want to get into that a little bit. Um, <laughs> well, I'm just curious how you kind of decided to kind of segue and go off and be like, you know what, I want to like hone in on that. Because I think a lot of the times professionals, they have a really hard time learning to niche down and figure out like where they want to go direction wise with their business. Yeah, I think and my niche has shifted kind of as I have. Like, I mean, I don't know if it's you know, partly a function of adult ADHD, partly a function of just like normal, like ev- personal evolution. Yeah, um, growth, career yeah, growth, personal yeah. growth. I, I can't imagine doing exactly the same thing for 40 years. I just I don't I don't know how, how people do that. I know that's really appealing to some people that is not all appealing to me. So I'm always looking <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, ultimately, I love learning. I love learning new things and new challenges. And so that's that's part of it there yeah but i do think that focusing on a niche has been really important and something i have to keep reminding myself (laughs) of because i easily get excited and want to do everything for all the people there's also a lot of people pleasing in there as well but um yeah but then you know can't help everybody when i try to help everybody i end up helping nobody and you know that kind of thing so 
I love that you touched on that because I feel like a lot of the times, especially when we're green trainers, we want to help everyone. We just want to like, okay, I'll take puppies, reactivity, whatever you got, throw it at me and I'll take it on. But then we start noticing like, oh, I actually really hate working with puppies or I really hate working (laughs) with like high energy dogs. And it's just for a lot of us. And I notice I have these conversations with a lot of trainer friends that will feel like we don't deserve to narrow our scope down almost or like that pressure of like, take them all and then I yeah. you know initially I was so shocked that anyone would want my help like that like I was so like as a bait well no honestly I still have those feelings but now I just I knew there's been better but as a baby <laughs> trainer I was like I don't belong here again I still oh, yeah. belong here but like if anyone was like oh I want to hire you I'd be like oh my god thank you, thank you right so to hire me um and so I was afraid to say no and there's a i mean there's uh, you said this is a mental health podcast we can yeah. do uh, there's a lot of a lot of trauma behind this. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> totally response. yes um but you know definitely some of it was an inability to tell anyone no to anything yeah. for any any reason oh my god so, yes yeah they were contacting they're like oh yes but i i work until you know 8 p.m at night so you know, you're gonna have to come and you know do uh, in-home lessons and that's uh, fine you know, sure yeah and i'd be like sure <laughs> that's, that's okay like i I normally start work at, at 7 a.m so the lesson at 9 p.m is fine i can do that i'll make that i'll make that happen you're hungry for the clients and, and you know having a livable wage and being able to provide for yourself and right. family <laughs> that's the big yeah. kicker i think that's like why we take everything on and then we're like oh, i can live but like don't have a life Right. No, that was definitely a, a problem. I, you know, I, my first mistake was not being born into money. And that was. Um, yep. Same yeah. here. I, Hard I can't worker. believe I did that. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Your sense so of humor much. kills me. I love it so much. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so growing up without a lot of money and. The scarcity. There's Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure in, internally, you know, at this point or even at that point. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. To not end up destitute. Yeah. But I think with the people pleasing and the needing to take all the clients on, I think that, you know, I we're around the same age demographic and we grew up with that MySpace, Facebook, like me, pay attention to me. What do you mean you don't like me? You're not, a, I'm not in your top eight. What did I do wrong? Internalize it. Mm-hmm. And then it's just that totally goes forward into our business of like, okay, why aren't I getting clients? Why aren't they liking my posts? Why aren't I getting followers? And then we just, for me specifically, I get into the hamster wheel of not good enough, imposter syndrome. I suck. Why am I here? Don't deserve to be here. And I think a lot of us have those inner thoughts. And then it stops us from really diving into our career. I mean, hello. I tapped out being a trainer after four years because I just was like, I, I'm not built for this. When no one else around me was talking about mental health. And, you know, just where I'm going with this is because a lot of times like you have a sucky session and you're just like, oh, I suck. I'm a bad trainer. Like I let that client down and it's like, well, okay, but maybe it was the client. Maybe it's the way it was communicated. And I think with a lot of that, we get into that internal spiral. And so I'm curious where it's been for you and your journey, where you've noticed that and how you've kind of worked to like maybe swat those thoughts away, because I know they'll always come up. Mm-hmm. Like I the imposter say, syndrome. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah. So for me, the the biggest challenge is I am like equally afraid of getting clients as I am of not getting clients because, oh, yes. in, you know, my, my preference, my natural inclination would be to not be perceived at all. Like, don't don't notice me. I would yes. just be like an invisible essence floating around the universe. But in, in the name of capitalism, it doesn't really work out. <laughs> so I've had to work on that. And then lots of, lots of, if someone contacts me, I won't really, I don't really know how to, to help them. Like, I don't know how to solve this because I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I'm making this up and someone's going to figure out that I'm just making this up. Do you still uh, feel that way now? Or was that like yeah, mostly in the I mean, beginning? The thoughts, oh, I actually was probably more confident at the very beginning because I didn't know it, what I didn't know yet. Um, right. So I, you know, I started very much from the, it's all how they're raised. I just have to, you know, love them hard enough and like, they're all savable and I can fix all the things. And uh, the universe, <laughs> the universe is real good at Smack helping down. out of that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hard reality check really quick. <laughs> so there, there is some of that. And yeah, so I'd actually, 
like in the in the weird like fever dream that has been my my trading journey, I was asked to speak at Clicker Expo, which I still present um, most years at Clicker Expo. And at one of the, I think it was probably the first Clicker Expo that I was presenting at. And I when was the first one? Oh God, time is a construct. I know. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it was. It was. It was in the before time, right? Like it was. It was pre-pandemic. Uh, which automatically makes it very difficult to nail down. Oh, um, always. Yeah. yeah Anything yeah, before yeah. 2020, I'm like, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So as, <laughs> get as good, guess as good as mine. Right. So it's into the end of college at the beginning of the pandemic. So <laughs> <it> <laughs> down. But but yeah, so I was I was at that uh, Clickers when I was still like even worse because now there's Kathy Sedeo and Ken Ramirez and like all of these people that. So, like, why am I here? Are, Do I deserve real, to yeah, be they're here? they're real trainers. And then there's me. And so I'm like, you know, kind of hiding in the corner. And they sat me next to Karen freaking Pryor at the dinner. Uh, and uh, I don't think I, I ate. My mouth was so dry the whole time. But in, in one of my one of my responses to feeling very anxious is I just like blurt out random things like oversharing. Sometimes. Oh, hi, are we yeah. the same person? Yeah. So I felt compelled to tell Karen Pryor that I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I bet she loved that vulnerability. At least I hope. Well, she she actually shook her head at me and she said, "None of us do, and we're all making it up." And I was like, "Oh my god." Okay. And I didn't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing because I still like I'm still in that place where I'm waiting for the real grown ups to show up and save me. Like I'm trying to hold on to things just long enough until they can get here. Yeah. And, and people are like, you know, there are no grown ups. You're supposed to be the grown up. And I think that's really terrifying. I don't consider that at 30. I'm like, I'm, I'm still a child here. Thank you for thinking I can own a home and run a business. But I keep waiting for them to find out that I've accidentally stolen this house. Right. <laughs> and I, I mean, I just figured out. Last week, um, what it really means to vacuum your refrigerator coils. And, and don't tell down. me that. I don't need to no. know that. No. So I'm, I'm down there scraping the, the, the walls of hay. Like there's a family of elk under there, and I'm scraping it out with a fork. And you know, I will cry because I, and then the whole net rest of the night, I was waiting for them to show up and revoke my home ownership privileges because I clearly am not enough of a grown up. But, anyways, back to the, back to the topic. <laughs> so it was actually, so, so that was interesting and helpful. Like I, you know, confessed to someone that I truly idolized. Right. Absolutely. And she, to just get reassured. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, you have the right thought process. You're not alone in that. That's huge. We're all, we're all doing that. Yeah. And, and I know Ken has told me he struggled with imposter syndrome complex whatever which i love that it's like you're the only white man that i've ever heard like read admit that. that yeah but and that, so and then there was something that kathy sadeo said not to me personally she said it like at a i don't know a seminar or presentation or something i can't remember where i heard it pretty sure it was her but i'm gonna give her credit because she deserves all the credit and and this is the one that i hold on to like every day uh, it's almost like a mantra and her i'm gonna paraphrase badly but what she was speaking to was the kind of like core belief that we have to like know everything and be like flawlessly good like experts in order to have value as a professional teaching others so oh, yeah. like yeah and she said something to the effect of like you you don't have to be at level 10 to help people who are at level one and level two. And since I consider Kathy to be like a level 10, um, I was like, wow, because I, re I did really feel like I, I need to go, I need to get a PhD in dog trading. And then I need to do like all in order to have check certain boxes yeah, to therefore like feel I need, adequate. I need the right merit badges in order to feel qualified. Right. And I've since read similar things in different places, not related to dog training, but just, you know, with regards to education and, and teaching and stuff. And I've really absorbed that because one of the things that I've noticed is not only do I not need to be a level 10 to help people who are ones and twos, brand new to dog training, people who are at level 10 are actually not as good a fit because oh, yeah. we, we learn best from people who are just a little bit ahead of us because they still remember what it's like to be a two. And that's part of how, like, it's part of what's behind how I've shifted up with my kind of population that I focus on because I'm actually not a great fit for brand new dog trainers anymore to a certain extent. I mean, you know, I consider myself maybe like a five on that scale, right? So I'm, <laughs> I'm actually best suited to help the threes and four. Um, we're going to be a better fit together. 
and they're gonna be a better fit to help people who are ones and twos. I love that. How did yeah. how did you kind of figure that out for yourself of like, oh wait, this is where I'm at. This is who I'm gonna help most. And, and removing that thought of you're needing to hit all these marks to feel like you need to be at that certain point. Did that make sense? I feel like I mean maybe. Um <laughs> I I don't know that I have like a single answer. I don't I mean, it's just like it's a, a collection of little things that I've just kind of noticed as far as like what I find reinforcing and where I'm noticing that I'm doing a better job. Okay. Um, so like as part of that whole niching down thing, you you really can't effectively like from a, an instructional like pedagogical standpoint teach both behavior 101 and introduction to competition. Right. At the same time. Yeah. So you will kind of have to have to pick, right? Am I am I focused on more like elementary school stuff or or you know college or graduate school? And I don't mean that as a like in a derogatory way at all. And the more I put into my own education for teaching people and giving feedback and learning about learning and how to improve myself as an instructor, I noticed that I didn't have enough room in a way, like resource wise, to to do both of those things. And then what was more effective in terms of like me kind of living a purposeful life. I get let's right. say really dorky. But, um, but you know, making the world a better place is I can work with the people who work with the people. And now I am actually able to help more dogs and their humans than one on one on the ground. So like we can kind of this is a little bit of a pyramid scheme, but it, 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 well, it's a ripple effect. You're just, you're yeah. helping in a different aspect and then it's trickling to other people. Yeah. 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 I love that. That's awesome. I'm curious because you did mention adult ADHD. So do you have adult ADHD as well? All right. Well, I am, I have ADHD and then okay. the, whether or not I'm an adult is um, up for a debate. <laughs> but yes, I have a di diagnosed neurodivergent human same here so with that when did you get diagnosed i was just diagnosed last march i believe and so i'm curious when you were diagnosed and where you kind of noticed like oh oh my brain works differently let's like lean into that more and help ourselves i hope you've been doing that so well so i was actually my story's a little different than most of us um i was actually diagnosed at 12 oh lucky which well in a sense. <laughs> well, right. So I It's was all relative. I was diagnosed at 12, and that was in the 90s when girls didn't have ADHD. Um, right. So that was, that gives you an idea of how bad it was um, that I was even evaluated. Now, I, I did, I was lucky in, in a lot of ways. My mom worked in special education, I think that really helped. My brother, of course, was diagnosed first because he had disciplinary issues and was a, a white boy, which also helped. And then I got like, kind of like, oh, well, so you were also diagnosed. I did not receive any treatment or support or accommodations. Um, so it was just kind of like a, here you go. Like, it was just like, okay. Uh, okay, thanks. What do I do with that? Yeah, now, now apply yourself now that you have that. So, because you have a lot of potential and if you could just apply yourself. But we're not going to help you figure that one out. Yes. And of course, like I did the thing like that, again, I think most of us did do where because I was bright, because I was a terrible people pleaser, I just killed myself and I was mostly pretty good at school. Like I mostly, I would have like random sitting still was even for me, was not, was not great. Um, <laughs> but I could, you know, I was doing well on the tests. And so I was, and I was not a, uh, was not a disciplinary challenge for the teachers. So the only problem was that I, you know, was forgetful and like would always lose my calculator or my notebooks and, you know, was late a lot and time blindness really, yeah time blind I don't really notice how much I was you know crying at lunch um and after school and and being a teenage girl they're like oh she's just <laughs> hormonal like yeah 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 so you know I got through college got into graduate school that graduate school was where the compensations fell apart which I again I think is a everybody hits some kind of wall there and for me it was grad school yep and so they diagnosed me with depression and anxiety and gave me an SSRI, which did nothing yep. uh, to help at all. And of course, once you have anxiety on your medical chart, you can't get treatment for anything after that. So I would love to have that removed. But it was then after my daughter was born when I hit a second wall and I went to my first to my OB and then to general practitioner. And like, I thought I had borderline personality disorder because oh, of like something. Hormones. 
Uh, it wrecks you. Um, there was, it was, I was afraid. I was very afraid. And she, I don't remember how I got, but it got, I got referred to a psychiatrist because they, it was not a great, ex- the whole thing was not a great experience until I got, and then I got really lucky with a psychiatrist and I was talking to the psychiatrist and then I had marked that I had the diagnosis of ADHD and he's like, well, let's talk about that. And, and I was talking, so then he did like, he did, we didn't do the whole screening thing again. I don't even really, I vaguely remember it from when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and you've not been treated at all this whole time. And and I was like, well, no, I just, you know, I'm not trying hard enough. And oh, oh, well, I don't know if I said this exactly, but that was kind of like, they just have to figure out how to try harder. Like tomorrow I just have to wake up and be a different person. And so then he said, well, you know, a lot of times when we get the ADHD treated, the anxiety goes away. I mean, it doesn't do anything about the decades of trauma that were <laughs> accumulated. That's all surface. But, yeah. <laughs> but he, he was totally right. Like it took it took a it took a while to even get on top of it. And I think I'd actually prior to that, I had been doing some like stuff on my own in terms of figuring out system. Like I've always I mean, this is part of what got me through in the first place, like that I'm that I am here to be here to have the, that conversation was mm-hmm. um, like an obsession with systems. If right. I find if I can find the right system the problem is they don't have the right system for remembering my homework the problem is they don't have the right system for managing whatever this thing is let me hack my brain and figure can, out yeah, yeah. figure it out and then you know and then all the which i had been at one point i screened for ocd which again was because i was so anxious about yeah. all of the things that were falling through the cracks and then just pedaling so hard to people, slam in your head against the wall trying to like figure yeah. out like what is it right right so you know researching like oh, adhd friendly ways to organize your home which was a great book that i found really helpful you know previously but yeah medication helps some not as much as i had hoped i see people on the internet attack like oh you know it's like this is what it's like to be normal and i was like well i'm not really having this like no. magical experience it you know a, a little bit helps for a few hours of the day <laughs> so i can get the dishwasher unloaded and, and stuff but but it is the rest of it coming together helps and like just knowing where to like wait the research, you know. Well, um, yeah. And, and being guided to a path of like, OK, this is where you can start figuring it out. And I'm glad that you touched on, you know, having improper diagnosis, because I think a lot of us, especially as female, born female, a lot of us get hit with, oh, you're just anxious. Oh, you're just depressed. Oh, it's just your hormones. And it's like, oh, wait, I am actually neurodivergent. And the reason I'm anxious and depressed is because my brain is working against me and no one has taught me how to work in favor of it or set it up in the best way possible. And yeah, I, medication only helps like a smidge amount, maybe so I can do my emails and like remember to drink water. But like, sometimes, sometimes I drink water. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. husband has ADHD as well. And I'm like, it's not working. I can't focus. And he's like, you know, it's just like it, it's the tip of the iceberg. You still have to sit down and do it. I'm like, well, what's the point then? Like, I still have to apply myself. If only. If only you applied yourself. If it's attention. <laughs> but I'm glad we're talking about this because I think a lot of us in the dog training community are neurodivergent. And I think it's kind of a block in the very beginning of trying to start a business because it's so daunting trying to look at the umbrella of how to navigate a business when, you know, certain things are very overwhelming to those of us. I hate bookkeeping. I'm terrible at math, like horrible. Yes. No, I can't do it. And overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. People are like, how do you do it? I'm like, I, I use people. I delegate. I ask for help where I can. And I think that goes hand in hand with having systems and, and finding ways to have other people help and do it. And I know I I am very privileged to have that option. I've also worked my butt off to be able to get to that option because I think a lot of us will scramble for the longest time trying to figure it out. So I'm curious, what systems did you figure out that like worked the best for your brain to give you a good jumping off point to really figure that out? Business and person. Yeah, let's start with business. So I, I did start delegating and that helped so much. I, it was a big expense for me. It, it's still a big expense, for me, but it was unbelievable how much that helped. And I, I, it took, it took a while. So like right now I have a bookkeeper that I love. The bookkeeper was the first thing that I hired because I'm so afraid of going to jail for tax fraud. 
Right. It's not because I'm clever enough to actually defraud the government. I don't understand. Like, I can't keep receipts. Like, I don't. And it's just it, QuickBooks has just made me cry. Like, I download because what you're supposed to do, right? You download QuickBooks. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was like, okay, now I have the QuickBooks and it's supposed to do something for me. And I don't really see that it's helping me in any way because I still have to put in all of this stuff. I'm still getting frustrated and burnt out. I'm still getting frustrated. Like, I'm, like, I found, you know, a check that had been floating around in my car for four months that I'd never deposited from a client and you know like that that kind of thing which just adds to the all the shaming you know self-loathing oh yeah so yeah so I, I did first bookkeeper was a night but it broke the seal of like trying you know well yeah you got your toe in yeah yeah and she just wasn't a, she just wasn't a good fit ultimately right. And it took me, I mean, until like probably two years ago to figure out that it wasn't just because I'm terrible. It was like just really we'd weren't a good fit together. The right like, the way she preferred to work and what I'm what works well for me were not the right things. And we, I only worked with her for a year or two, I think. And then I switched to like someone else that was a little bit better. And now a bookkeeper that is um, is amazing. Um, and I mean, I don't know that he does anything particularly. Like, he does his job. Yeah. No, he does, he does his job. That's like he's, he is totally on board with some of my weird systems that I have for um for keeping up with things. So I read, I read, um, profit first, which okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Um, this was several years, many years ago at this point. And that actually helped me the most in terms of figuring out a, like a book. Cause like I had this one really bad year with, um, where I learned the term tax liability, Ooh. which is a word I wish I had never had to find out about. Uh, it was probably like the first or second year that I had my own business and I had not figured out about saving my own tax money and mm -hmm. i hate that reality had that, that happen was, that was really rough um and so then i read profit first i forget who recommended it to me and that really helped like it was a very adhd friendly i don't know if he has adhd i think there's a high likelihood that he might just uh. from from the book plus it's an audio book so that helps me out a lot also. oh yeah and so i implemented a very like modified version of what he talks about there because not everything that what he's talking about is applicable for a sole proprietor right kind of thing and so I, I implemented that and it's like with different <laughs> accounts and you allocate things as you go and so I, I was able to that, and that made a huge difference and so I have a bookkeeper who understands what I'm trying to do there and is cool with it and is just so very chill when I do something stupid like actually use my business credit card at Sephora and like that used to be like something I would feel so mortified that I would have like I spent money on something frivolous in the first place right my business card and i it's my business credit card like it's all the same money i don't know why i get so hung up about it but i absolutely got very hung up about having to confess to this frivolous pur purchase with company money my, my my boss must be so terrible um <laughs> and he's like, oh, no there's a code there's a code for that in quickbooks and i was like what right <laughs> exactly and now he's like what's this home deep i was like oh that was a personal. It's like, okay, good. She like does all the things. So we found a way to work together that is not overwhelming for me. He can distill things down to yes or no questions or multiple choice. Oh. Oh. And he can give me context when I ask, a, or, or rather, like when he needs to know something, he can give me the context so that I can understand, because I need, always need to understand why in order to do a thing. Like that's right. part of how, what I have to have. Um, but I also, when it comes to bookkeeping and taxes, I also don't want to know. So that's yeah. complicated, very complicated there. But anyway, so he's got he's got that balance down pretty well. So that and that has helped keep me out of prison to date. That's that, but that's the like most challenging part of running a business. And I think you know personally, I think it's the scariest part because it's money and it's legal. The part you can actually things. go to jail for yeah. right. Like, the rest of it, I just have to live in a cardboard box behind McDonald's. But, um, but but that one, I, you could go to prison. Right. So, well, yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of the times, like, we choose to set up a business. And unless we, you know, have the means to hire a business consultant, which a lot of us don't, then we're kind of just going in blind, like, I think this is legal. Is this a business? I fill the form out on legal Zoom. Yeah. I am a business. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? I have no idea how to navigate it. And then we get drowned with the overwhelm in it. Um, and like you said, negative self talk and thinking that, you know, we're not doing it right. And, and yes, oh, God, being able to delegate is so huge mm -hmm. and just pass it off when it's something that we're not good at. And I think a lot of the times we think we have to be good at like the whole picture oh, yeah. when it's like, eh, no, you don't. You really don't. Um, yeah. It's just finding ways to like offset that. So 
you have the bookkeeper. Are there any other systems you have in place with your business that have just made it easier to navigate for you? Yes. So I do have a VA who does with like an hour of some number of hours per month more now than when I started. I started off with like very minimal contract, just like a you know couple of hours a week. And I wasn't even using them, but she took over my scheduling stuff. That's huge. huge. One of the, like probably the, that's probably harder for me than bookkeeping, to be honest. Right. Um, is it letting go of the control of it that was hard or no implementing? Um, like decision fatigue and like trying to, I have a problem with trying to optimize everything all of the time and so I especially when I was doing a lot of in-homes I would like waste a lot of time trying to calculate the best possible route to go to all of the the in-homes and like try to schedule them all to like like completely optimize the whole that it, it was ridiculous um spending way more time trying to do that but that also resulted in a lot of delays with communicating back to the clients in terms of scheduling just getting overwhelmed and then when I would feel overwhelmed that's when I just start saying yes to everything because I can't say no and trying to figure out like okay well um this one's over here that's gonna be like 30 minutes and giving her just like a set of rules like just basic guidelines like, yeah yeah of how long the appointments were and, and the drive times and, and and everything and then she took that and then she just does it and I don't have to make those decisions and Ugh. she doesn't have the emotional problems because it's not her doctor it's not her clients, so she doesn't care. Right. I mean, she does not care, but she doesn't care. And so she can just say, we have Thursday available. Instead of me trying to tack on, you know, something else to Wednesday, she, like she can just say, we have, these are the two appointments that we have, you know, <laughs> this is the next availability. And there's none of the, again, none of the emotional stuff. Because I'm totally like, well, I suppose I could fit one more in. Oh, well, you know, I could like not eat that. I can skip lunch and, can, and you know, lunch, yeah. yeah. You know, I can make, I'll figure out a way to make that work. And, and you know, we, oh, <sighs> You know, I'm really scheduling three weeks out, but I could Friday night. Like it, it, I don't need a day off. It's fine. It's cool. It's, yeah. <laughs> so, so she could she could do that. And now it's even a step further because I use Calendly for um, people to select their own appointment. Oh yeah, so much easier. But online for stuff. Yeah. Letting that go, I feel like, can be really hard for a lot of us, especially those of us that are anxious. And we're I'm in that boat right now of trying to learn to I described it to my husband as I was like, I feel like I have my stove and I have multiple pans on and I'm not ready to give the pan to anyone else. I'm just going to keep juggling them and juggling them and trying to figure out. And he's just like, but there's so many things that like it's just it's taking up too much of your time and somebody else can do it that's better suited. and that's their job to do it. Mm -hmm. But somehow I'm like, I don't want to waste the money. I don't want to like, it's fine. I can do it. I can handle it all. And so it's, what advice do you have for anyone that may be feeling that they are juggling too many pans on their stove right now? And just like, even if it's like one hour every two weeks, having someone take over, any advice for that? I mean, it's not as expensive as you think. And um, people, one of the things that I have discovered I don't know if this is going to even going to answer your question, but whatever. People who aren't you can make like, you know how you know how no matter what your life looks like, you could totally get somebody else's life together if they would just listen to you. Right. Oh, like, yeah. Like that's very easy to see from here, from the outside. And I've discovered that that applies in small ways as well. <laughs> I can't make decisions for myself, <laughs> but I can make decisions for other people. And so like I, my friend, uh, Laurie Luck, who's also a trainer, also KPA faculty, uh, she is not quite, she does not have the challenge. She's not, she's not all, my, all my baggage. But um, <laughs> we, we noticed that we have the same thing because like she told me she had just spent 45 minutes trying to pick out a photograph of her dogs to order a custom mouse pad. Uh, uh, like years ago, we had mice, mouses for our computers. And I'm like, oh. And so I go to her Instagram. I grab a couple I thought looked really good. I upload them to, I don't know, Shutterfly or whatever we were looking at. And I just ordered a mouse pad and had it sent to her house. Because it didn't matter, right? Like any right. of them would have been fine. And she's done the same thing for me on a, on a number. Like, I just need you to pick one of, like, I've been researching this for three days and I just need, you know, a new <laughs> wireless keyboard. Can you just, <laughs> can you, can you, and she, she would just like, like, this is the one you want. And like, send me the Amazon link and I would just, you know, click buy now. So where was I going with that? Well, um, it does, it does answer of, of like having someone just be like, tell me which one. It's, the control, yeah, it's the control. The control thing is so expensive. At least I'm only talking about myself, but it costs so much energetically that um, even that I'm one. I'm already doing it badly, so that was part of what made it easy for me to delegate because I'm already doing this poorly. So like somebody else doing it poorly, at least I'm not doing it. 
Right. Um, and they'll probably and, be faster about it. And they're faster <laughs> about it. And and the people, it's like with my bookkeeper, he appears to love bookkeeping. He's passionate about it. He'll, he wants to do calls with me and talk to me about my, my books. And I was like, I just want to know how much I need to pay the IRS. Right. Uh, but he's really as, gets as excited about bookkeeping things as I do about dog training thing. Oh, that's what you want. That's the kind of person is, you want to hire. T- totally. It is. I can't. It, it's unimaginable. I can believe that it exists. And there are people for whom scheduling stuff and booking whatever isn't hard for them. Like they actually enjoy those kinds of tasks. Mm -hmm. The people with really organized pantries, I like to look at them on Instagram, but I never like will never. Yeah, that's not me. No, there there are people who who like that and are good at it. And so and this is part of the problem. Like I, I use the smallest you know, package of hours per month and I, and I rarely use them up no. because the things that were taking me, you know, five or 10 hours a week, she does in an hour and a half because one, she's better at it. Two, she doesn't have the, the like waffling, the overthinking, um, yeah. overthinking um, stuff. And, and it just doesn't cost her as much for $25 an hour. Like that's like unbelievably unbelievable like at the time i was like well i'm just going to try this and i can always just schedule an, one extra lesson per week to cover it right there's ways to subsidize and offset that if we yeah. need to and it turned out because the other thing that she does for me that made a huge impact like bringing back to the mental health thing is she just deletes the emails that i don't need to see yes i had a discussion with sarah strumming about this last week yeah. Um, she was saying that she has a, and after we hang up, I'll tell you what she said the folder name is because it's quite <laughs> hilarious. But she said that her assistant, like there are certain, you know, emails, whether they're snarky or she just doesn't need to read them. Her assistant will put them in the folder. Sarah never reads them. And I think that's so great because it's just you don't need to take that in. You don't need to see it. What's it going to do for you? But there's, if you're managing this... it, you can't filter yeah. that. Yeah, no. And, and I felt for a long time like I was supposed to like I had to to be a real person like I had to read you need that critique and take it in I had to be ready for the feedback now of course I was expecting it and I do want well want so strong word but I do want because I want to do a good job that's important to me and you know I'm doing the best I can but I want to know like if I'm putting my energy in the right places and right um so I I do want to know where I'm doing well and what I could do better at. And then I can make decisions of, well, actually, I can't do better at that. So I guess I need to figure out something else. And but not everyone because email is free. And especially mm-hmm. since launching the podcast, there are people who believe that they I need their opinion. And some of those emails, there's a, a nugget of something that I could make use of. And some of them are just garbage. Like, like, I am so sorry that you, know, you had such a terrible childhood, <laughs> but that trauma does not need to be expressed in my inbox. Hi, um, that's that's how I like am generous. We're all we're all while working us. through stuff. Yeah, yeah. And if yours the way you're coping with that is sending strangers all caps email, <laughs> I'm not going to read it. Um, but she can just delete those, and she can pull the ones if there are some some that have like well, there's something in there that we could act on. That's worth actual. picking apart. Yeah. She can pull it out <laughs> and give it to me in a more straightforward, like just factual. That way. isn't going to make you cry. And... Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is separated from the personal critique. Like, okay, that is something. You know what? That's that's a fair request. I can, you know, I can work with that. Right. Um, and then she saves the ones in, that I read that are that are nice. So that's, that's helpful. But yeah, that just taking away the just the, I don't know, the crazy ones from angry people who are just angry uh, and I don't even see them. And that's helped because one, I don't have the impact of those. But then I also don't have the dread of opening my inbox because it may or may not contain an ugly email. And it's mm-hmm. not like I get that many. Like I don't, I don't get them that many. It takes just one people. though. Right, right. And that's, yeah. I remember there's a quote that I read when I was first publishing my book from, I want to say Elizabeth Gilbert. And she said that reading reviews of your own creative work is like taking a bite of a sandwich that may or may not contain glass. And I was like, oh God, that's true. Ooh. Um, that's a really <laughs> good way to put it. And and I feel that way when I'm reading, you know, survey results. And I feel that way when I open my inbox because there may or may not be some like really angry person working stuff out on me. And that that would then kick me into the like procrastination dread cycle where I am like dicking around and not accomplishing anything. And I'm not going through my email because I was afraid of what might be in there. So then the email index gets backed up. And now there's the shame of like real grownups would 
would you know keep inbox zero <sighs> and you're at like inbox a thousand so what kind Ugh. of garbage person are you but now that i know that she's pulling those out and i don't ever even see she doesn't even tell me that they were there so they're just they don't exist they go away. yeah it makes it so much easier for me to then go into my inbox on a regular on my regular schedule and clear out the things that need my attention and right well and you know it's filtered in a way that it's not going to trip you up during your day or make you overthink or second guess how you're feeling about yourself because Oh, we all wake up feeling, you know, not confident. And then it's like, oh, here, let me open my inbox. And it's a big, you know, kick into the gut. And you're like, oh, well, well that's a great way to start my day. Now I'm just going to let that roll and take over. And it's so easy to get into that negative shame spiral and negative self-talk and get real down on ourselves. It's the easiest one to lean into. But I think it takes a lot when we do have to read that stuff and, and finding like, OK, well, wh how much of this is actually about me and how much of this can I actually just take with a grain of salt and improve? Because, mm -hmm. you know, woof culture, like I get plenty of back talk from plenty of people who claim to be force free, but they are not force free to people. But that happens. And I think I've just learned when someone is actually coming at we with good intention, good feedback that is useful, or are they just being a dick? <laughs> because there is always that measure in there. And I think that's so important that you talk about that and that you have those guardrails to really mm -hmm. protect yourself and your mental health for your business, because that's something that a lot of us don't think about even. Even if, even if it's just someone that filters our inbox, it's so big. And it's not a big thing, but you having to go in and see just even the beginning of the email, it's like, oh, that's it. Like oh, yeah, your stomach little, drops. Yeah. Yeah. Just the little like preview that Gmail gives you that like that first sentence. They're like, oh, my day is going to go shit now. Yeah. Like, yeah. It just takes that one thing. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm glad that you do that. That is such a good goal to have. And it's something to work up to. It's not something that we can get right out the gate sometimes starting our business. But I think knowing that's a point that we can work towards and it doesn't it's not going to bleed our wallet dry. Just having that one thing implemented. Not at all. Like, like really not at all. Like it's it's the amount of time that I got back that I could put towards the things that were making me money to pay the bills, the amount of energy that I had. And then also like I was a better, I am a better trainer because once your things fell through the cracks, people get responses much faster than they did before. So I oh right yeah can run more lessons, which meant that like, and it was, again, it was really one lesson. I was paying her the equivalent of one of my lessons per week. And now I pay her less than that because I've raised her prices since whenever this was eight years ago, five years, five, I don't know, time of the contract. Uh, but she and she's raised her prices. So it, it, the not falling through the cracks, the not having, like I have fewer emails in my inbox altogether because I no longer get the did you get my email emails. <laughs> I was wanting to see, you know, just circling emails. back. Just circling back. I'm like, God damn it. I need to <laughs> get them on the calendar, but I also need to get my hair cut. I don't know. How I'm gonna... Anyways, I, I wish I'd done it way, way earlier, but I, I did. I feel like, oh, well. Did you talk yourself out of like feeling like you deserved? I put air quotes on that. Absolutely don't deserve it because if I were a real person, I wouldn't need the help. Real professionals work through it. Air quotes real, again. Real professionals. I should just be able to keep up with my inbox and definitely self-criticism has worked so well for me in <laughs> changing all of that the whole my whole life. Um, I'll just really double down on on feeling bad about it will help. It did not. Spoiler did not help. No. But but also just I had in my mind that it was going to be so expensive and I needed to wait until I had, you know, a more stable business or well, guess what? X um, amount not, in the account. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, guess what? Um, Not being able to consistently respond to scheduling emails does not result in a stable business. Or a stable income flow. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas making sure. Oh, and that was the other thing because she'll she sends invoices. Um. So I would do work and then I would fail to send the invoice to get paid. She doesn't have to deposit checks for me. That is still on me. So I still have to deposit the checks. But it I made way more money, more regularly, more consistently once I had somebody making sure those things weren't falling through their cracks, that I was actually sending the invoices and keeping up with if they didn't get paid. That's the, uh, you know, if somebody's card doesn't go through, she makes sure that that gets followed up on. Me, when the card didn't go through, or I remember the first time somebody bounced a check with me, I felt responsible for their bounce check. 
Uh, so well no one tells you how to navigate that either how to do this <laughs> like what do you say how do you like i mean i've experienced being the person who <laughs> check or had the credit card decline but i've never <laughs> been on that side of it and she just like unemotionally like like hey do you have another form of payment and make sure that the money comes so just the, the amount of money i was giving away on that kind of thing was was i mean, it was embarrassing and totally it was paid for her, her, it, her rate right and I, something i always say is it just it kind of comes out in the wash in that sense like mm-hmm. whether it's coming back to your energy levels to whatever you're putting back into your business your time downtime whatever it is it's going to end up going in that other category yeah so i i feel like that's something that if you are struggling with even just managing your inbox, just hiring someone to go through that weekly is a, it's a good toe into the waters of learning how to delegate. And it's it's a learned skill. I think we do have to train ourselves in giving up those things and being able to pass those hats off to other people, even though a lot of us are, quote unquote, control freaks and and don't want to do that because I struggle with that all the time. Um, I tell my husband constantly to do chores, but then I'm like, you're not doing it the way I'm going to do it, so I'm just going to do them all. And then I'm like, why am I resentful that you don't take out the trash? Because I keep doing it myself. Yes, yes, yes. I you know, definitely have controlling stuff. Although it, just at least for me personally, it's less that I feel like they won't do it as well as me. I already feel like I'm not doing things. Like I already just feel like I'm not doing things very well. It's, it's more the admitting that I can't do better or that it's not worth like not in your wheelhouse. In yeah. Thing. Yeah. There's something in that for me that that and that part I have gotten much, much better at leaning into like, oh, I don't. Like, it's not a reflection on my character. No one's forcing I'm you to, yeah. Really bad at bookkeeping or like really bad at this other thing. Or like, I, you know, I made the rules for her to do my scheduling. She, like, she would handle when I was traveling and speaking a lot, doing seminars, she would handle making the travel arrangements and stuff. That had to be so helpful. Very, very helpful. Just, he's gonna, just executive function. Just she could work down a checklist and I just can't. Oh, um, let me overthink it for an hour or three. Let me overthink it, you know. And <laughs> yeah, so giving, you know, giving just some rules like I, these are the hotel I prefer. Yeah, these are the airlines. These are the, you know, this is how long it takes me to get to the airport from, you know, my house and, and you know, various rules. Like I, you know, I no longer will stay in someone's house when I'm traveling to speak. I need a hotel room because I need my own space. Yep. Anyway, so it's just so much easier for her to hold those boundaries and follow those guidelines. And I was doing it poorly. Like I wasn't following my own guidelines. Right. So like, what am I giving up control of here? Like that's that's so for yeah, for me it was it was the I don't have to be good at everything. Uh Ooh, just let that sink in. <laughs> yeah. I'm still working I'm still working on that. But oh, same. Yeah. Um but and the culture doesn't really help because we are, you know, you'll see, you'll see criticisms out there. Like you have to be, uh, to make a living doing this, you have to be an expert at dog training, obviously. You also have to be an expert at teaching people. And so like, oh, you know, positive reinforcement dog trainer, that's one skill set. Being a positive reinforcement human instructor is a different skill set. And it's not a guarantee, but you are expected to be both. And then you're also expected to be good at customer service. That's yet another skill set. That's not one that I particularly have. And you're also supposed to be good at, you know, at marketing. And you're also in communication at, and yeah, bookkeeping and, and scheduling. And I'm like, holy crow. So I need to go back. Let's just count up the graduate degrees that I'm going to be accumulating in the next decade. I absolutely need the uh, <laughs> master's in social work. I think we all can agree on that one. I'm going to need an MBA for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, for that as well. And the problem with something in marketing, can't do sales because I understand a little bit the difference between marketing and sales. I don't, but I understand a little bit because I can, podcasts are to a certain extent right marketing element but the sales is where you actually have to tell people to buy and i'm better at saying you probably won't like this it's a psychological warfare in that i guess it's complicated yeah there's a lot we're supposed to be good at we're expected to be good at and i am not good at all of those things no and i think we we internalize a lot of it and get into the doubt of like okay now i'm not good at this and how am i supposed to like keep this and and make a living doing this when apparently Mm -hmm. i suck at everything when i mean and right and then also as a woman i also am supposed to be an expert at housekeeping i'm also supposed to uh, but i'm also supposed to like keep up with car maintenance what and then there's this whole refrigerator coil 
Oh, I, there's yes. thousands of examples yeah, no. of things that I have discovered that I was supposed to have been doing as a homeowner. Like, oh, okay, you're supposed to, you know, they need to give you a book filter. or like a video of like things you need to check like X amount of times during the year. Because no one told me that I needed to check my dryer vent and get that cleaned. I'm like, someone's supposed to do that? Like, what? Sorry, did I just add yeah. to that anxiety? No, I'm actually on top of the dryer vent situation. <laughs> that's so that that one I that one I had was I did not know that this is with the refrigerator coils is I thought I was doing it. And it turns out that I've just this whole time been vacuuming the cover on the ice maker. There's like a whatever the pump or the motor. I don't I'm not, I'm not, I know what you're talking about. Has, yeah. Has this little cover on it. And I thought that was a refrigerator coil. And it's not. Um, it's actually not. So I actually thought I was doing it. But I was not. It turns out I had not been this entire time. So years and years of, of that. I also thought I was doing OK with changing the filters for my HVAC. Oh, yeah. Don't filters. get me on that one. Yeah. But no. It turns out there's also a filter inside the furnace that you have to like mm -hmm. climb up there and get it. I found that out like <laughs> two months ago. And somehow we're trusted to run our own businesses. And, and we, you know, I don't know Girl, how that. Maybe <laughs> take a baby home from the hospital. Like, I barely had to sign anything. They just, like, let me walk away with her. Like, you, you sure? I, like, kind of know how to feed her. I don't know. Somebody. Like, what if she wakes up? I, I cannot do that right now. So I applaud anyone that has little human beings and runs a business and, you know, has a hobby. Like, that's a lot. Are we supposed to have hobbies? Oh, sorry. Was that? <laughs> Here I am just assuming you have time for those ones. Yes. <laughs> it's, on, it's, on, it's on my list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Sarah Strumming was like, I had to Google what hobbies were before we hopped on because I do everything's dog training. I'm like, I feel that. Is gardening a hobby? Is standing in the yard staring at the sun a hobby? Because that's what I do. I, how about how about uh, online shopping? Is that a hobby? Oh, hardcore. Um, yes. I'm into that one. Yeah. Or or just uh, throwing a bunch of things into the cart and then like overthinking the <laughs> and thinking about it for a week and then talking myself out of how I don't deserve or need those things. Yes. 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 <laughs> so we talked just like a hair about imposter syndrome. And I do want to ask you, you know, since you do talk on the platforms and at conferences and you were asked to speak on top of, you know, navigating having a podcast for successfully quite a few years now you've been doing that how has the imposter syndrome been within that realm and and feeling like yes i do deserve to be here and i do know what i'm talking about and and people want to hear what i have to say i mean it's still there i won't lie i it's a you know i just do it anyways like do you kind of just like kind of push yourself like all right let's i just yeah i i just i I don't know. I just, I just like swallow the nausea and I just like squinch up my eyes and and I just and I just get it done. It's like um, I think it's like Elise Elise Myers on uh, on TikTok or whatever says like you know, do it scared. Like that's I'm not not scared. Like at it, it, no point have I ever not been like am I still like super sweaty before I get up on stage? Absolutely. Do I like like use the that bathroom six times um, before like in the hour before? Absolutely. Like that's not changing. None of that has changed. I just have i mean it's fluency honestly i yeah. just um it's a learned skill yeah i have have gotten fluent and then and i can just do more things while terrified <laughs> and that that part that part has gotten easier to a certain extent um, or larger maybe not easier but it you know it encompasses more right so before i let you go i do want to talk about burnout just a little bit because it's yeah it's inevitable. It happens. And sometimes, especially with the brains that we have, we like to, me specifically, I will go, 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 and then crash and be like, why am I burnt out? Why am I crying over looking at my email? Scroll. How is the burnout for you? How do you try your best to prevent it? And then how do you kind of bounce back from it? A little hard question. Um, I know. So I've had like little burnouts. It didn't feel little at the time, but like little experiences with that at different times in my life. Oh, sure. And then the larger one that I think we've all hit with the pandemic and just everything. Fun. And then the two years of doing school from home by myself while also trying to, like, continue a business, which had to change rather dramatically, relatively, right. which can happen to, to most of us. <laughs> uh, maybe not everybody trying to do school from home with a small child at the same time. But, you know, no support. Like, that was, that was damage. Like, that, was da that did damage to me that I'm still trying to claw my way back from oh absolutely um, yeah yeah and but i will say so for me one of the things that i've learned the big like the warning sign that i'm about to get in trouble i'm gonna i've got a couple but a big one that i keep an eye on the closest eye on 
is when I find myself getting irritated with my clients, my my students. In what way? For, for not knowing the things that I haven't taught them. <laughs> and that is a like that's one of my core values that I um that I hold because I had the experience from the others. There there are and this kind of ties into the like why tens aren't the best to teach twos, right? The the attitude that I've encountered with some professionals at times where such that you feel like you're an idiot for not knowing something that nobody's ever taught you. And I set out from the beginning to watch out for that tone and to try really to work really hard. To not have that tone with clients, you mean? To stay, yes. To okay. stay out of that. Well, to st stay away from people who are in that right. space. Right. And also not to get into that space myself. And so if I find like someone's asking me a question that is a valid question on the subject matter that they are paying me to teach them and I'm irritated with them for wanting me to do my job, that tells me that there's something that needs attention. Why am I feeling that way on right my now? Side. Yeah. And right. That that is a it's not even super early that that's the like you have begun process of falling off a cliff. Right. So when I catch myself having those feelings, I need to change something right away. And some of the time it's just like, hey, you know, just, you know, sit down like I'm, I need to, to take Monday off. Um, I'll be back in the office on Tuesday or sometimes longer. Um, I need to take a few days off and I want you to walk away. When I catch it early, then I'm able to circle back to what, what I've loved that got me started on this path in the first place. Like I love learning. And so <laughs> That often means like, okay, I'm going to trim my schedule for, you know, the next couple of days or whatever is depends on many variables and then find something to learn about that is exciting to me. So like hit some novelty, hit some ideally some external validation of some sort. So doing a course that has a certificate at the end. So, you know, like Susan Friedman's LLA. Right. Was, a, was one I used in that space at one point. Um. And I've done, I did KPA under similar circumstances early on, but find something, something where I can like touch on that, the things that got me excited. Like reignite you. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. Yeah. Like learn something new, take, um, you know, pick up a new sport, um, pick up, like find, so, like, so for, for, for me, my rest, I'm going to put it air quote, is not the same as, as like, like going to a spa. Although I do sometimes fantasize about being hospitalized with nothing very dangerous or painful, but just for you know, maybe a week or two weeks. Just to like nap. Yeah. So nobody, <laughs> nobody want anything from me. Um, <laughs> that's, that's actually, and that actually took me a while to, to land on because it doesn't sound like it would be restful. But for how my system works, that's the, my daughter calls it shaking up her glitter jar. And, and I think that's actually kind of perfect. I need, I need to, I need something to shake it up to get stimulated. And I mean, that doesn't address the like, like there still has to be like the physical needs need to be like, I need to usually when that has happened, I'm also not been sleeping. I've also like been falling on right. other things. Like it's all tends to come as chicken or egg, but they all tend to fall on that same cycle. So it's like, right. Make sure I'm getting sleep. I need to drink the water. I need to eat food because I tend to stop eating when I'm getting into that space. And yep. um, all kinds of bad disordered behavior patterns start to show up there, which again, are those, there's a lot of things that I can look for like, oh, I am only drinking protein shakes. And that's like the only source of calories that I've, I've had the last three days. Right. What's going on? The, <laughs> we're getting into that place. So, but yeah, so, so for me, those are the things that, that help me recover. And it does take, it does have to like, cause again, time is, is what's well, contract, but also right. like, it out. Kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, not it, having it them will, all blend together. It will mean like at least temporarily replacing some of the revenue acquiring like time tasks with this like enrichment. <laughs> I need more enrichment in my enclosure. <laughs> yes. Uh, but that's been, that's really been the most helpful thing for me. Something in that, and it can look like a lot of different things, but yeah. Well, and I think it's also what you're feeling that you need in the moment because you may not need the same thing every time we're human. You may not need exactly the same thing. Like, and I tried, I tried the stuff that like, like the, the mental health influencers, like I did the coloring. I have a paint by number, but I've never finished a paint by number in my life. I can't finish a cross I can't it. sit I can't down do, that long. I can't yeah. sit down. But the the learning something new is helpful for stimulating. It always helps me generate. You're getting out of your mind too. It gets me out of my head. It, it, it. 
I was just I was talking to a person recently who's a local neighbor who is a first responder and loves does like blacksmithing in like craft like blacksmith. It's so random. As his <laughs> hobby. And he was saying, well, because you can't think about anything else. You've got molten hot metal. Like you can't get distracted or you'll burn your leg off or whatever. Right. And I was like, I, I totally get that. Like I feel that way about <laughs> like the things, riding horses and, and train working, especially working with certain types of dogs that I tend to gravitate towards. Like, right. Take your eye off the ball if you're, you're going to pull back and Watch dog. your fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so those are very helpful for me, but also again, and this is maybe just specific to me, but other people may experience as well. It helps me so much stay in the place of empathy for my learners when I'm spending a significant amount of my time as a learner, as putting yourself in that, yeah, that mind state. Yeah. Who doesn't know what's going on, who doesn't know how to find stuff, which seems obvious to people who've been doing it for a long time. And that has helped me so much because I work my my you know my online program is for people who are getting started in novice obedience so first level right. obedience and I mean that's part of my my imposter complex of like I can't teach people competitive sports because I don't have you know world championship and I've not been doing it for as long as most of the people in this industry or certainly in the com- competition industry because it's you know it's an expensive hobby that takes time and money and most of us who are in our, you know, twenties and thirties don't have that. And right. certainly not start having kids and, and <laughs> stuff. So what's wrong with that? Oh, but I'm not trying to teach people who want world championships. I want to work with the people who want to get started. Right. They, do good, they just want to do really good training and they want a, you know, a project to work on. Like they're probably coming from very much the same place that I am when I'm going to a uh, you know, frisbee dog um, seminar or fly ball. Um, yeah. Just gaining insight, gaining knowledge and, yeah, and having, having a, yeah, yeah, learning stuff, doing good training and having a, you know, a project, a medium to apply these things to as you're learning. So it's not just, you know, abstract anymore. And part of what makes me good at that is when it wasn't that long ago that I was the novice competitor. Right. Five minutes ago, as far as I'm concerned. So again, that makes me more qualified than someone who's, it's been 30 years since right. they had a novice dog. But be- because of that, I really, it's really important to me to keep it fresh, what it is like to feel like a beginner and to, to be a learner. And the best way for me to do that is to go out, find something new, I'm interested in, but I don't know very much about and have that experience and then I always gain some kind of insight that I can bring back and it changes how I teach oh that's so good but I think a lot of us don't think to like even go to that because it's like well that's dog training technically that's work that's not relaxing but I think it's just what your brain needs in the moment that's going to get you out of the spiral and the self-doubt and the down talk because yeah when you're a learner you're new and everyone else in that platform is going to be on the same level as you so you're not going to have that like inferiority complex with anyone. Yeah. And it, I mean, it doesn't have, at least for me, it doesn't have to be dog training. It often is. It is helpful when it, so I did like a, like a running class a couple of years ago, a course for like form, like running technique. And I learned a lot about coaching physical skills in a way that was really useful. And I was able to bring that. I can still get applied. Yeah. Yeah. And see like, oh, this is a way. And then I learned things like, oh, well, I would never organize information like this because this is really overwhelming. And then I turn around and I look at like, I've been doing exactly the same thing. Let's break that down. (laughs) Why are my clients frustrated? Oh, Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, this conversation has been so awesome. I have always loved your sense of humor. And so just having it applied with the mental health spiel has been awesome. And I'm excited to see what our listeners think of it. Um, Any last minute advice for anyone that is starting new business, trying to just change their angle right now and they're feeling stuck, feeling like they don't deserve to do it? It's going to sound cliche and like kind of overdone, but I really think that the, the biggest piece of advice that I would have given myself would be the, that that niching down in some way and different resources presented in different ways, like different ways to do it. And I don't think it matters. Like, I think it doesn't matter. Find what works for you. Um, and it can. OK, well, here's two. This is this is a terrible parentheses. Pick a horse and ride it is another one that I that's oh. like a, a little mantra because you're going to be listening and you're like, well, how do I niche down? Like, well, I, I like working with reactive dogs or you don't like working with or whatever. Or, but, you know, I also really like puppies. And but I also, you know, I feel compelled to help rescues. It, you don't have to, to marry it. Like, pick one. Try it out. Try it out. And then yeah. you can always change or evolve or, or you know, nudge it and just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it probably doesn't matter. Like, like, it doesn't matter. Right. It, it doesn't just, need to be permanent. It can change. It doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be the perfect niche. 
It doesn't right. need to be perfectly described. Like I, I took, like I read, like an online course at the beginning of trying to figure out how to be a business owner and not go to jail. And she's just like, oh, you have to like write your perfect customer avatar. And I just spiraled because oh, I God. like, and then, and it was a long time later, I was like, oh, well, now I understand the principle that they were trying to get at with that. Right. And it turns out I'm actually already doing that. I didn't need to do it that way to get to like, who am I good at helping? I'm good at helping people that are a lot like me, that are a lot right. like me five years ago. Those are the people that I am the best equipped is the, the five years ago me. So that's that the, the niching down that you don't have to take everything. I, I don't do separation anxiety, period, ever. I'm not going to yeah. do it. And there's people that specify in that. We they love it. That. That yeah. Is, that is, I'm so grateful that they are out there, that they exist. And I will spur in a heartbeat. Uh, I don't even <laughs> read the fourth message, the first sentence in your email. Like, let me give you a list of somebody in your area. Right. Here's three really qualified people that can help. And those people niching down is yeah. like their business crew that way. That so, yes, yeah, that, exactly. That really helps. Because I don't need a dog trainer in Detroit. I need a separation anxiety specialist. Beautiful. I hear people that <laughs> love separation anxiety are really good at it. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Hannah. It's been so awesome having you on. Um, definitely going to need to have you on for another episode because we can't talk about mental health enough. So, <laughs> Especially these days, <laughs> yes, for sure. Thank, thank you for having me. And if you like what we're doing here on the Leashed Mind podcast and you want to help others find us, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media, give us a rating wherever you got your podcasts, either that's leaving a review on Apple or giving us a star rating on Spotify or just leaving a little R plus on our Facebook page. It's all appreciated. Thank you. And we will be back with another episode.